Welcome back players. Today we are talking about the three traps to avoid when looking at your standings at the next Pro Tour in Baltimore. So let's jump right into it. This topic is not only about competing in TCGs but about games in general and it is also an opportunity to compare situations that are high pressures to those who may not seem like this in the first place. And this topic came up to me in the last weeks not only as I thought about the Pro Tour in Baltimore, but also from reading some books and also coming across some articles online. And I have those linked down in the description for you to check out for sure. But I also want to mention this because I think this is a really interesting part to talk about for competitive players, but also those who are looking to become a competitive player. So these books that I came across this topic was The Slight Edge, but I also read the What It Takes book from Sebastian Vollmer. So if you want to get familiar with these topics, definitely take a look at those books too. So coming back to the Flesh and Blood Pro Tour, um, I want to quickly introduce this topic in uh, showing the first Pro Tour champion, Pablo Pintor, from last year's Pro Tour in New Jersey. So let's take a look how he felt when winning the Pro Tour. I'm Pablo Pintor, I came from Spain, from a little town in Madrid called Aranjuez and I have won the first Pro Tour of the Flesh and Blood organized play and <laughs> I'm feeling incredible right now. Like, I just... So, I think this was a good starting point and one, if you want to check out the full video it is linked down below too. Um, I also want to mention at this point because I will film again with uh, one of the most high competitive teams in Flesh and Blood, the Wolfpack, at the next Pro Tour. Uh, if you want to dive deeper into this, check out my Patreon, it is also linked down below. And yeah, now let's jump right into the main scenarios of today's video because as you saw, Pablo Pinto was really amazed and really overwhelmed by all the emotions of uh, winning the Pro Tour. And this is a perfect example for today's topic because we will actually look at some scenarios here that took him on his way of actually winning the Pro Tour. And I want you to dive into this too. So um, I have some questions here that describes the scenarios and try uh, really to take an active point in here and uh, comment down below of how you thought about this topic and how you would have answered these or maybe you were even in these situations in the past at uh, TCG tournaments or uh, playing games yourself. So the first scenario is you are competing in the first day of Pro Tour and the standings tell you a 0-3 record. So from here on we want to talk about two options and the first option is you take the decision and drop out to play side events in the tournament. And the second option is you try the best you can for the next coming games. So uh, we have some more questions like this, so be sure to answer them for yourself and see how the transition from scenario to, to scenario takes you. And also a deep question for this um, scenario here is try to ask yourself can you still win the Pro Tour at this point when you look at your standings and you see you lost three times from three games? Do you think you can still win the Pro Tour? And I mean this is also an emotional question rather than a rational question because it is a high pressure emotional situation for every competitive player if you want to actually top or win the Pro Tour at this point. So let's see the second scenario which is you are competing in the first day of the world championship and the standings tell you a 4-4 record. So you won four games, but you also lost four games. Coming back to the options again, um, the first option is you drop out and you play the calling tomorrow. So also a high competitive tournament, but not the world championship. And the second option is 
You stay in the tournament and you try the best you can at day two. Which road would you have taken here? <laughs> uh, answer it in the comments and make sure to stick around and see what it actually means. And coming back to uh, the main question here is, at this point for Worlds, can you still land in Worlds Top 64? This is the question when you are looking at your records. So do you believe from an emotional standpoint rather than a rational standpoint, do you think you can still land in Worlds Top 64 here? Okay, um, again, make also sure to check out uh, the article, play the game, not the score, in the description down below if you want to see actually what uh, this means and I also want to before coming back to the scenarios here um, talk about the experiences that I have made with competitive players in the last year in the flesh and blood because I actually never competed at a tournament like the pro tour or the world championship but I saw a lot of these players winning there or getting a really high um, seed at the uh, final standings. And let's just try to dive a little bit deeper into what this actually means. And I have here three examples. I have Pablo Pinto. We actually, we actually saw a video snippet of him winning the Pro Tour. He was the first world champ uh, the first flesh and blood pro tour champion excuse me <laughs> he was winning twenty five thousand dollars at this event and this event was held in three days so where you basically needed to play flesh and blood 24 7 in really intense games and this meant you would play 17 games that last 50 minutes around 50 minutes each then I have another example uh, where I could witness of um, this topic we are talking about today. And this was Sander Neft aka Berg at the Calling Utrecht in last year. And he was the first flesh and blood calling champion of Europe. He was winning $7,000 and he actually needed to compete in two days of basically 24-7 intense TCG games. Also 17 games that last uh, between 30 and 50 minutes, but in two disciplines rather than in one discipline like uh, Pablo did. And also we uh, see here there is a little bit of a difference. So at the Pro Tour over 1000 players uh, were attending the event and at the Calling Utrecht only 300 people were attending the event. So this is a little bit of a difference, but both tournaments were at a high level of competing. And then coming to the uh, third person, I actually could witness of um, yeah, winning a really high tournament is Michael Hamilton at the last uh, year's World Championship. Michael is the current World Champion in the Flesh and Blood and he was winning $100,000, but he also needed to compete in three days of 24-7 intense TCG games, but he actually needed to compete in three different disciplines and in a total of 19 games that last 30 to 50 minutes. And he actually really needed to compete against the best of the best. So why does this matter? Um, I really hear often from these players and you saw three examples of these players I was in connection with the last year. And most of them I hear talking about, I wasn't really thinking about making day two or I hear them, I did not expect to win. This is something I really often hear again and again. But um, now the question is, but how could they win then if they really didn't thought about this? How could they make it to the top even when not expecting to win? And this is a really interesting question here that we will dive deeper into now. But I also wanted to separate it before uh, actually talking about this in more depth because I are also heard from some of the players that are more on the casual side that this may be a really toxic behavior when thinking about this. But I don't really think so. I think from what I have seen that these players that, are, um, that were winning, they also had the most fun competing at these games. So quickly note on that. <laughs> 
uh, let's jump right back to the first scenario and that was you are competing in the first day of Pro Tour and the standings tell you a 0-3 record. This is <laughs> this was the actual number. So coming back to the two options, uh, it is really um, it is needed that we look at your thoughts that are running through your head here in a little bit more uh, of a deeply way. So there are players who went to 0 so far. This is one of the thoughts that could run through your head. But you could also think, oh, okay, maybe I lose the next game too. So then I would go 2-4, uh, 0-4. Some friends of you also play in the tournament, but now they decide to play side events. And you also think about, okay, the calling day one is still tomorrow. So maybe it doesn't matter at this point because I can play the calling tomorrow. Or you could win the next game. Or you could win the next game and some of the players are already at 3-0. So how high of a chance do you think you have when these thoughts are running through your head and you're looking at your standings with a three loss on the record? I want to come back here to Pablo again. And now we look at a different snippet in the video because Pablo actually was in nearly the same situation like we talked now. And we will see what this actually meant for him and how he responded to that. Had a pretty rough start at the tournament. I lost my first two rounds. I had to win almost every every other game. And yeah, I'm playing in the top eight in the Pro Tour. I'm so happy that I was able to make the cut. I will play against Prison in my first matchup. So let's hope it goes well. But yeah, just being here is, is, is already a blessing. So I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> It was uh, a bit lucky because I believe uh, one person with X3 uh, got cut down. So yeah, I was hoping that uh, <laughs> I was not that that person. But yeah, that was uh, that was pretty good. I, I had a lot of really exciting games. I so coming back now to the board. Now you saw Pablo told us he had a really rough start in the tournament, and he even lost his first couple of games. So. He ended with a X3 record, but he made it actually to the top and won the Pro Tour, even though he had this um, bad start. And now let's come back to our second scenario, which we were talking about even the World Championship. So you are at a 4-4 record. How do you decide? Are you playing the calling tomorrow or are you staying in for day two? And do you even still think that you can make it to top 64. Let's look at the video. And I mean, the big question on Saturday was who makes it to the top cut? You were on day one for the Worlds? Yes. But then you decided to quit. Yes. Tell me about it. After 4-4 uh, records, I wanted to uh, play the calling. But uh, now, uh, when I put that in perspective, I saw people making top 32 uh, with a four with a four loss record, even five losses. So I could have tried to go seven one on day two, but uh, I didn't know about that. I think I miscalculated, so I decided to play the calling. And I was so happy. For so I think Pedro is a perfect example here of what can happen when you look at the standings and then decide to quit. But of course, Pedro had a lot of fun at the tournament for sure. But this is, like I said, a perfect example of the other side. When you are looking at your standings and what can happen when you just rely on the moment and when you look at the standings. So let's come actually now to the three traps to avoid when you are looking at your standings and maybe even competing at the next Pro Tour in the next week. So and. I want to touch on this because 
I really want to emphasize this and also show why it really matters from game to game and why these continuous decisions matter and what you can remember when you are competing. So let's come to the first one, which is actually the focus. So maybe you have the dream of actually topping a pro tour and really tell yourself when you are looking at the standings, do you want to stay disciplined? So do you want to focus on your main goal or your dream, so to say, of topping the pro tour? And maybe even when losing, gaining some experience in the pro tour and doing better the next time. Or do you want to let your focus fall apart and walk a new road? So maybe playing side events or the calling and actually in the end losing your focus. That is, I think, the first trap that you need to avoid when you really want to make it to the top. And we actually saw why this really matters in two really different examples. So let's come to the second trap, which I actually think is judging the whole timeline by a state in time, which is over, over <laughs> excuse me, which is also what I read in the books and also on the articles online. But also what I think is really important to remember really from game to game, because let's come back to our examples. Let's imagine you are 2-0. So you are doing really well so far, but that doesn't really mean you will win all 16 games of the tournament, even though the scoreboard tells you you are one of the best players at the moment. And this translates also to a really different situation. Maybe you are... 8-0 even you didn't lost one game in eight games and this 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 is not meaning you will win the pro tour even though the scoreboard is telling you you are one of the best best players or even the best player at the moment but on the other flip side this is also true because when you are judging the timeline even when you were losing two out of two games this doesn't really mean you will you will lose all games even though the scoreboard is telling you you are one of the worst players at the moment. This is a really good example of what Pablo experienced, but we will actually see also uh, when losing some games doesn't really mean that you can't make it to the top in the third example with Michael Hamilton. But for now, let's keep it for the traps that you actually can avoid when you are competing in the next Pro Tour. And that is asking yourself, who are you competing with? Because most players who I met winning had the most fun competing. I already told you that and showed that also to you. Um, and I think those players that I met and that I was witnessed of winning were really competing with themselves rather than focusing on competing with everybody else. And I can really emphasize this here in the two roads that you can take when you are asking this, am I competing with myself or with all the other players? And I think when you are competing with yourself, um, looking at the standings, you will think of maybe I can do it better the next time. So you actually are trying to get better the next match. And you already won in this situation because you gave your best and did better than before. So you didn't quit or you even played a better game in the next time. And the other road, I think, is really when you are competing with only the other people rather than competing on yourself or focusing on yourself is looking at standings and complaining about people who are X0 maybe at this time when you only won, uh, lost the games. So I think in this, in this scenario, you already lost because you think your outcome depends on those of the other players. So you're really focusing on what the other people are achieving rather than what you could achieve on your own. Okay, why does this matter <laughs> repeatedly? We already talked about this and I mentioned it a few times. I really think this really matters from game to game and also from looking at the standings from game to game. So tournaments are one game by game and not in one moment. And this is something to really uh, remember when you are in these high pressure uh, situations. And here is why it matters until the last moment, even when you are nearly to the top eight. So let's look at Michael.
I thought I was dead when I lost round 15, and then I saw standings, and I was in eighth place, and I'm like, that means my last round, if I win, I'm in, and I was just like, over the moon, because <laughs> I, I really thought I was dead, so, just like, getting one more chance, playing that last round, squeaking it out, and then making top eight, it's, I feel amazing, I feel really happy. <laughs> so, so, you actually heard it, like, he really took it as having a last chance of showing he could be the best player. Even though he would be the last player to enter top eight, he didn't even thought about this anymore, but he kept going. And he won. He is the world champion. And I think this also shows this mindset and also what you can learn from this. And I really wish you the best luck of competing in the next time. And I, I hope you could take something away with yourself here for the next tournament that you are competing in. So remember this and uh, like, like I said in the beginning, again, if you want to check out more on this topic, uh, maybe check out the article down below or check out the books that I mentioned in the beginning. And also remember that this doesn't mean that you never look at the score. Um, I think you will always look at the score after you are finished, but keep these traps in mind and maybe you feel a little bit better the next time when you lose the first two games of the Pro Tour. Remember Pablo's story. So I also want to even uh, end with a quote here from uh, Warren Buffett who also says, Games are won by players who focus on the playing field, not by those whose eyes are glued to the scoreboard. So thank you so much for joining in and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already because I will cover the Proto Baltimore in the next week. Uh, like I said, with uh, the, the Wolfpack, with Team Wolfpack, Michael Hamilton, Zach Bunn and the amazing um, Wolfpack, which I'm really honored and thankful of, which I can work together with, with at the tournament. And also, if you even want to dive deeper than what I show here uh, on the channel, in these topics then check out my patreon down below and if you even want to support me a little bit further then also check out the paypal donation link and yeah just in general thank you so much for uh, joining in oh sorry this was the wrong button um, i hope to see you the next time and also if you are at proto baltimore say hello and let's have a chat about flesh and blood and competing <laughs>